Oh, hello, everyone. It seems to me that there are five buzzwords in storage. And I'm going to do this silly exercise to see if you can guess uh, the words I have in mind. I'm going to read out uh, each line, and then you can say the word you think it is. I keep my email in the cloud. Most of my servers are? <laughs> OK, I heard Dell. Who else? Virtualized. You know, if you speak with uh, IT admins, that's what they would say. 90% you know, of my servers are virtualized. My backup storage does it. And now I want my primary storage to do dedupe. My SAM is not big enough for my big data. Okay, and you know this is and there's big data, data analytics, map reduce, all of these things go together. Okay, and this this one is easy. My storage has the IOPS because it has Flash. Right. Okay. So Flash uh, is one of the buzzwords. And this shows how hot it is. Five years ago, none of the major storage vendors had any product with Flash in it. And now every one of them has such a product. Also, there are uh, a you know, bunch of startups that I have listed here that, have, that are using Flash as a centerpiece. And probably there are a whole bunch that I don't know about. And, and there are probably some starting this month. <laughs> so I've listed the, uh, the public companies and the private companies in alphabetical order, to be fair. And, and I noticed something uh, funny. <laughs> can, can you not, you know? <laughs> the, right, <laughs> there's this amazing thing. There's an alphabetical split between the two. You know, what a profound uh, observation. <laughs> okay, so, so enough of that. So if everyone is doing Flash, you might ask, isn't it a done deal? You know, what's there to talk about? And the thing is that everyone is doing it somewhat differently. It, it's fascinating how many different ways there are of using Flash in the data center. So what I'm going to do is organize this design space around Flash as a series of five decision points. Okay. First, do you put Flash in server host or in storage? If you put it in storage, do you have only Flash or a combination of Flash and disk in a hybrid? If you use a flash and disk hybrid, do you use it as an endpoint of storage, like disk? Or do you use it as an accelerator for data that's stored on disk? If you use it as an accelerator, do you use it to accelerate writes as a write buffer, or accelerate reads as a cache? And finally, if you use it to accelerate reads, how do you get your write IOPS? So do you still use the traditional disk layout, which is read optimized? Or do you use one of the, the, the funkier layouts, which are, which are write optimized? So in each of these cases, Nimble has made the right choice. <laughs> So at least the right hand choice. I believe also the right versus wrong choice. But it, it may be that there is no right versus wrong here. It, it depends on the target application, the market focus, you know, how you're trying to differentiate your product, et cetera. And, and many of these choices are not mutually exclusive. So for example, you can have Flash in the server host as well as in storage. You can use it for write acceleration and for read acceleration. 
And, and if you're EMC, you do a little bit of everything. So what I'm going to do for most of this talk is, uh, is debate the pros and cons of each of these choices. But before I dive into that debate, I want to tell you a little bit about nimble storage so you have the context around why we made the choices we did. Varun Mehta and I co-founded this company in early 2008. So this was before any major vendor had announced flash-related products. Now, both of us have a background in working uh, with storage startups that have innovative file systems. So uh, Varun was the number 11 employee at NetApp, and then he moved on to Panassas, which, uh, as some of you may know, builds scale-out NAS. And then uh, he was the first VP of engineering at Data Domain, uh, again, which, uh, as you may know, uh, builds backup storage based on dedupe. Raju has already told you about my background, um, you know, again, sort of mostly around building file systems. Now, at Nimble Storage, our, our mission is to build storage arrays that pack a good amount of performance as well as a good amount of capacity in what appears to the user as a single tier of storage. And we do this by using a combination of flash and disk and a new file system that makes uh, use of these two resources efficiently. And this is important because most of the storage systems out there in the market are either performance optimized or capacity optimized, but not both. And in particular, the performance optimized systems are very skimpy on capacity and are very expensive on a dollar per gigabyte basis. So we are aiming to be good with both dollar per IOPS and dollar per gigabytes. Now it is general purpose storage, but the focus is on mainstream applications like VMware storage as, as VMFS data stores, uh, Exchange, and database systems like SQL. We have been selling since uh, 2010, and as far as we can tell by reading S1s of public companies and, and, and based on hearsay about other private companies, we are the fastest growing company in this area uh, based on revenue in the first seven quarters. Okay, so back to our design space. The first decision point is whether to put flash in server host or in storage. And by putting flash in server host, I mean direct attached flash. Flash that's not shared between hosts, at least not directly. You know, it might be indirectly shared through host to host access. By putting flash in storage, I mean networked storage, as in SAN or NAS, which is shared between, between hosts. Okay, so reasons for putting flash in the host, you get lower latency. Okay. The flash read latency it can vary between 20 microseconds and 200 microseconds, depending on the interconnect that you're using. So, you know, whether it's PCI flash or uh, a commodity flash drive. The network round trip latency could be between 10 to 100 microseconds. So that's what you're saving by putting flash directly in, in the server host. And that's uh, a noticeable fraction, but it's not a dramatic, dramatically big fraction. And most applications really don't care about saving tens of microseconds. 
And the reason is that they have enough of queuing going on that it masks the network latency. But there are some applications that have a low queue depth and have tight requirements of latency, like real-time trading, for which it does matter. Another advantage you get with putting Flash in the server host is scalable bandwidth. So you, as you add more hosts, you get more aggregate bandwidth between the application and Flash. Now this could be done with shared Flash as well, except it would take expensive networking gear, you know, 10 gig switches, et cetera. And it might take scale out storage. So, but with, with this way, you know, putting Flash directly in the server, you get scalable bandwidth sort of for free. It, it works particularly well if your application can be easily partitioned and parallelized with good locality, uh, such as what you would get with uh, MapReduce or, or data analytics in general. However, for most applications, uh, the mainstream applications that I was talking about earlier, the throughput is not really bottlenecked by the network bandwidth. It's still bottlenecked by the storage. And if you assume that, you know, if you assume, you know, for example, let's say you have a flash drive that gives you 100k IOPS, and you can support that over a 10 gb link, Once you have a sufficiently long queue depth, it doesn't matter in terms of throughput whether you connect it directly in the server or in your network. Your, you know, the max throughput you're going to get is still 100k IOPS. Uh, and by little theorem, latency is directly related to throughput. So once you have a long enough queue depth, your latency also is the same because it's dominated by queuing delays. Okay, reasons for putting flash in storage? Well, by definition, it supports multi-host access. So if you have a distributed application like file service, you can get to your data in flash from any host. Also, it supports uh, migration of virtual machines from one host to another. They can still access their data in the uh, shared host, uh, sh uh, shared storage. Now this can be done with direct attached flash as well, with peer-to-peer uh, -peer or host-to-host -host access, such as you'll get with a distributed file system or distributed caching or cooperative caching. But it's, in my view, complicated, and you know, unless you have put, a, put in a lot of effort into getting rid of all of the bugs, it, it is somewhat error prone. For example, what do you do if there's a network partition? The other problem with uh, using this approach of a distributed file system is that you lose the proximity advantage that you had with direct attached flash. So your latencies are no longer low, and, and you might again run into network bandwidth bottlenecks. Another advantage of putting flash in storage is that uh, it provides high availability. With direct attached flash, if the server goes down, the flash in it, you, know, you lose access to the flash within it. And you can work around this by mirroring the data across the host, but that just multiplies the, uh, the flash cost, and flash is expensive. And, and typically, uh, for the uh, applications that I'm talking about, uh, the mainstream applications in the mid-market, you don't use erasure coding for this because you, know, you would use erasure coding when you have hundreds of nodes, when you have enough scale, uh, and you don't have that kind of scale uh, in the mid-market. On the other hand, with uh, shared storage, uh, you know, storage is designed to be highly available. You know, the host can go down, even a storage controller might go down, uh, but you know, it's designed such that there's no single point of failure without 
really without duplicating the data. So you know, often there would be two controllers with shared access to a bunch of drives, such that even if one controller goes down, you still have access to flash through the other one. The third reason, that if you have any storage in, if you have any shared storage, then it actually pays off to have some flash in it. And the reason is that the storage system is likely to have some metadata, like a block map. And flash can accelerate that metadata. And it's, it's a big bang for the buck kind of scenario, whereby accelerating just a little bit of data in the storage system, its performance can be improved significantly. And no amount of flash on the server side will, will help you with this, because the server does not see this storage metadata. So I believe there's a good reason to put flash in storage. And as I said earlier, it's not mutually exclusive. You can have it in both places. You know, just like with DRAM, nobody asks, you know, should we put the DRAM in server or in storage? So somewhat similar with flash. Okay, so uh, the second decision point. If you have put flash in storage, should you use only flash or a hybrid of flash and disk? The advantage of using only flash is that it gives you guaranteed high performance. With a hybrid system, you can try your best to put the hot data in flash, but you cannot prevent misses. What you can do is control the expected miss rate and thereby keep the expected latency down. But the worst case latency can be bad. And, and there are some applications that might care about the worst case latency. So again, trading uh, is such an application. And I would think that there are medical applications that also care about worst case latencies. Now, it's not completely true that with flash-only storage you get uniformly low latencies. And in particular, if there is any garbage collection going on in flash, it can create a hiccup for your read requests. And, and there are a few all-flash systems that are sophisticated enough to mask even that garbage collection latency. The next reason to do only flash is that hybrid is more complex. You have two different storage media, flash and disk, and they have different performance characteristics, different failure characteristics, and you have to design separately for the two of them. The third is, is that with only flash, you have no mechanically moving parts, so you, know, you can, it's, it's mechanically rugged, and that's of interest uh, in, in some applications, for example, with the military. Okay, so reasons for going with a hybrid. Well, flash is expensive. The high density disk drive is at roughly 10 cents per gigabyte. And it does not matter anymore whether it's SAS or SATA. What matters is that it's high density and low RPM, and that's what makes it cheap. On the other hand, the cheapest uh, flash drives, the commodity MLC SSDs, are $1.5 per gigabyte. So that's 15x costlier. And in most uh, flash-only systems, uh, you generally tend to use enterprise-grade MLC, which is further 2x costlier. And the reason it's more costlier is that it's optimized for handling random writes. It has a more sophisticated controller, uh, more uh, sophisticated firmware, and it has some over-provisioning in the flash so it can do its garbage collection efficiently and thereby keep the right amplification down. So that brings up the relative cost of flash to disk to 30x. Now flash, the, the ratio uh, flash to disk 
on a per gigabyte basis is going to fall, but it's not, going, it's not clear how fast it will fall. And there are some concerns about this. You know, as you increase the density of flash, its performance degrades, its reliability also degrades. And so you know, some of you may have seen this paper from FAST this year. It was titled, The Bleak Future of NAND Flash. And, and the title is sort of jazzed up, but, but it's, it's eliminating a good point that you know, with disk, we lament the fact that as the disk density is increasing, its performance is not catching up. You know, it's not uh, increasing proportionally, especially the random reads. With flash, as density is increasing, the performance is degrading. So you know, that puts it in, pers in perspective with, with what we are used to. Now, some vendors that are using all flash are making use of data reduction technologies to reduce the effective cost of flash per gigabyte. And there are two technologies here. There is compression. But compression you can do on disk as well as on flash. So on that front, it's it's neutral, you know, it still keeps the same fl uh, flash to disk price ratio. Dedupe is a little bit easier on flash. I won't go into the reasons. But Dedupe varies quite wildly because it's a, you know, a compression is a local property based on the data type. Dedupe is a more global property based not just on the data type but on your data set. So you know, if you have 10 copies of a document, you'll get 10x dedupe. If you have only two, you'll get only two. And in practice, for primary storage, you, know, you get about 1.5x reduction. In a good case, you might get 2x. And even if you get 2x, flash is still more expensive than disk by 15x. Now, flash is expensive, and at the same time, much of the data can be cold. So think about all of your old email, about the VMs that have been spun down. That, that's an interesting term, to spin down VMs. I guess once disks are no longer there. And finally, there are snapshots. Snapshots are cold, and they're increasingly more important because the world is slowly moving away from copy-based backups to doing data protection using a combination of snapshots and replication. The idea is that you can recover from user errors, like you know, somebody deleted a file by mistake, and also application corruptions, like your database got corrupted, by using the locally stored snapshots and if the whole storage system goes down for some reason, for example, in a disaster, you can recover from a replica using peer-to-peer -peer replication. So this, this would be a hot replica that the applications can fail over to directly. And this is much simpler and much cheaper than copying your data to a backup storage system. But it works only if you can store a sufficient number of snapshots on your primary storage system. Okay. And you wouldn't want to do that if you have only flash. So here's the result of a survey conducted by ESG last year around reasons for not adopting flash in the data center. And I'll read out the top few reasons here. The top one is too expensive relative to HDDs. The second is the technology needs to mature. Third, limited drive capacity. And some of this you know, is getting addressed uh, as we're getting higher density flash drives. 
The fourth is concerns about the reliability, longevity of solid state storage components. Which brings me to my last reason for using a hybrid, which is uncertainties around the reliability of flash. So the disk was invented more than 50 years ago. Flash was invented in the 1980s, but it got into enterprise storage only about five years ago. And as you may have seen, with papers being published on disk failure characteristics, we are still you know, getting there in terms of understanding how this can behave. So you can imagine how long it will take for us to truly understand the failure characteristics of flash. And, and if you think that disk is a peculiar kind of device, flash is much more peculiar. Right? You know, what's commonly known is its limitations around write endurance, that you can write to it only a certain number of times. What's uh, not so well known is that it also has limited retention. Uh, it has something called read disturb, where if you read uh, a page multiple times, then it can actually perturb the, the values. And, and many of these problems can be mitigated. You know, not completely solved, but mitigated, and although at, you know, that takes even more cost, more complexity. So I, I don't want you to get me wrong here. You know, nobody likes hard disks. You know, that's why we call it, call it spinning rust. And I do believe that you know, sometime in the future, some solid state technology will replace the hard disk. We, we all hope that it happens uh, sooner rather than later. But in my mind, flash is not ready yet. It, so building systems with all flash seems a little bit like uh, building all electric cars in the late 1990s with uh, nickel metal hydride batteries uh, instead of the modern batteries. So it, it doesn't feel ready yet. It feels too fragile. And in fact, I would say the question is not just uh, when flash will replace the hard disk but whether it is the right solid state technology to replace the hard disk. I don't know the answer to that. I believe the best strategy is to, you know, for the time being, use flash for its strengths and to work around it, its weaknesses. And that means keeping disk in the loop. Okay, so assuming that we have a flash and, flash and disk hybrid, the next question is, do we use it as an endpoint of storage or as an accelerator? And, and by an endpoint of storage, I mean something that stores the data separately, independently of disk. Okay, so it's, it's a tier or it's a, it's a, a parallel of disk. As an accelerator, it's just accelerating data stored on disk, which you know, could be a read cache or a write buffer. Okay, so reasons for using Flash as an endpoint. Well, if you are a vendor that already has uh, a storage stack that deals with disk drives, it's not too hard to replace your bunch of disk drives with Flash drives. And, and this holds particularly well if you don't care about moving data between the two tiers. Another reason to have Flash as endpoint is that it avoids duplication of data between Flash and disk. But if you think about it a little bit more, it's not that much of a reason because disk is so much cheaper than Flash that the duplication does not cost you much. Okay, so reasons for using Flash as accelerator. If you're using endpoints, if you're using Flash and disk as endpoints, 
then data tends to be confined within its own you know, tier or endpoint. Actually, modern systems do support automatic migration of data. It's called automatic tiering, but it's slow. And there are fundamental reasons for why it is slow. One is that when you move data between endpoints, you're changing the home location of data. So you have to update your persistent block maps. It's, it's, the analogy I use here is that it is like having to sell your house and buy a new house every time you travel instead of renting a, renting a room in a hotel. The, uh, the other reason why migrating data between endpoints is slow is that if you promote any bit of data to Flash, you have to make space for it by demoting some data back from Flash to disk. And that causes disk I.O., which is the very thing that you were trying to avoid. So because there are these two costs, systems that do automatic migration need to make sure that the data is worthy of moving, that the benefit you get is, is worth the cost. Okay. And to do that, it has to carefully study the, the access before it can judge some data as being hot enough to be promoted or cold enough to be demoted. Okay. And often it would also, to reduce the cost, work in relatively large chunks, so megabytes instead of what you could do when using Flash as an accelerator, which is you move a few kilobytes of data. So because, because you are not able to move the data quickly, if you have an application that is performance sensitive and the working set might shift over time, you're forced to pin all of the data set in Flash. And that defeats the purpose of having a hybrid system, because you're no longer thin provisioning flash. You are going to have a big flash tier because you want to keep all of the data set in there. In contrast, if you are using flash as acceleration, the location in flash is temporary. So you can quickly move data from disk to flash. You don't have to move any data back from flash to disk because you can just evict out the copy in the flash, or rather evict out some copy of some cold data in flash. So, so this way it is much more responsive. Uh, you don't have to thick provision your flash. You can use only a little bit of flash, uh, which in turn keeps the, the overall cost down. Okay, so assuming that you're using Flash to accelerate access for data already stored on disk, do you use it as a write buffer to accelerate writes? And, and in this mode, you could also say that it's doing write back caching. Or do you use it as a read cache to accelerate only reads, which would deal with writes either as a write through cache or by invalidate, invalidating the data, if you already have a previous copy of that data. Reasons for using Flash as a write buffer, it gives you lower latency than you would get from disk. Okay, so data can be written to Flash and acknowledged as, as having been stabilized. Disk latencies are in the order of a few milliseconds. Flash latencies are in the order of, for writes, in the order of uh, hundreds of microseconds. And here it depends on whether you're using SLC or MLC. And, and in general, as the density increases, the latency also increases. So you can use Flash as, as a buffer uh, and do better than disk. But there is another alternative. You can use NVRAM 
and here by NVRAM I mean DRAM with some power protection technology, and that can be much faster. You know, so if you if you have a PCI connected NVRAM device, it would take about 50 microseconds, and the and you know we are gradually moving to having and we RAM available as DIMMs that can go directly on the motherboard, then it would be in tens of nanoseconds. Another advantage NVRAM has over flash is that it does not burn out, which is a concern with using flash as a write buffer, that you're pushing all your writes through it. Now, flash does have one advantage over NVRAM, that you can get much more of it than you would uh, with NVRAM. So typically you will have a few gigabytes of NVRAM in a system. But with flash you can have hundreds of gigabytes. Right? So that gives you a larger NVRAM buffer, sorry, larger write buffer, which means that you can absorb a larger burst of high throughput writes. Okay. So that does count. And I could imagine systems that would use NVRAM as their primary write buffer and then flash as a secondary write buffer, larger write buffer. But one thing to note here is that although with, with you know, a larger write buffer you'll be able to absorb a larger burst of writes, your sustainable throughput is still limited by how fast you can drain the write buffer to the underlying disk subsystem. And you know, this is like having a larger sink with the same size drain hole. You can throw a bunch, you know, a whole lot of water into it at once, but you cannot keep doing it. At some point, the sink will fill up, and then you can put water into it only as fast as it will drain out. So the drain speed largely remains the same. But actually, it, it can be helped a little bit by having a larger write buffer because you can collapse multiple writes to the same block. Okay. So with that, the amount of data you're draining is a little bit less than what came in. The second way in which you can use a large uh, write buffer is that you can resort the writes by their logical addresses such that the output stream is, is more sorted, is, is more sequential. And this is beneficial if you have an underlying disk storage system that preserves the sequential locality. There are limits to both of these optimizations of collapsing overwrites and resorting by the logical address. If you have checkpoints on disk, you don't want to move writes across these checkpoints. So that limits how much you can gain from having a large write buffer. Okay. So reasons for using flash as a read cache. It allows the storage system to control how much data you write to flash and thereby control the wear rate because the system needs to put only data that it considers cache-worthy into Flash. And you can do interesting things, like based on the remaining life of Flash, you can raise or lower that bar of cache-worthiness and thereby easily control how much data is getting written to Flash. Another advantage is that with using flash as a read cache, the system can tolerate all the unreliability around flash gracefully. And this is because the, the data in the cache is a subset of the data already stored on disk. So in other words, it's all clean data. There's no dirty data. So what the system can do is just check some all the blocks in flash and, and, verif and verify upon any read that the checksum matches. If the checksum does not match, the system can just toss away the data. 
you don't need high endurance flash for this. You can use the commodity MLC. The final advantage is that, which is sort of related to being able to tolerate flash failures, is that you don't need parity or any form of redundancy. Okay. So at the bare minimum, when using flash as a write buffer, or, or as if you have only flash, you would use dual parity. And if you have a rate group that is 10 wide, that's 20% overhead. And that's a bare minimal. You know, often you would have either mirroring, that would be a lot more overhead, or some sort of you know, local parity and global parity, the kind we saw with, uh, with Azure yesterday. And, and that also has more than 20% overhead. Okay, so this uh, brings us to the final decision point. If, if we use Flash as a read cache, what do, you, what do we do about the disk layout? And here, by read-optimized disk layout, I mean the traditional layout where blocks are written in place. And by write-optimized layout, I mean a layout that enables uh, coalescing of, of block writes regardless of their logical addresses. So you can you know, just take whatever blocks are being written and concatenate them and write them out as one large chunk on disk. So benefits of a read-optimized disk layout, well, by definition, it preserves sequential locality, so sequential reads will run fast. Okay. I want to point out here that even the read-optimized disk layout won't help you with random reads. Okay. It'll help you only with sequential reads. Another advantage is that the map that translates logical addresses to physical locations is generally smaller with such a layout. And the reason is that you know, generally you will have some large unit over which you have sequential locality. And this might be one full rate stripe. So what you need is a map that tracks where the various stripes are. With a ride optimized system, which is coalescing blocks regardless of their logical addresses, any block can go anywhere. So you, the system has to track each block independently. So what you have is, is a block map. And, and there are many more blocks than there are stripes. So you have a larger map with the right optimized system. And a smaller map means, you know, first it's, it takes less space, so it's more cacheable, et cetera. But also all the operations are generally faster. Reasons for write optimized disk layout. Okay. So what's uh, happening is that the IOs hitting the disk subsystem are increasingly write dominated. And the reason is that now we have large caches that could be in the host or in the storage that absorb most of the reads. So what's trickling down is the writes. And as I said earlier, you may have write buffers, but write buffers help a little bit with reducing the write volume through collapsing the overwrites, but not dramatically. So most of the writes have to go through to disk. And interestingly, Mendel Rosenblum, who, as you may know, later co-founded VMware, wrote uh, this in, you know, about 20 years ago as part of his PhD thesis. Increasing memory sizes will make the caches more and more effective at satisfying read requests. As a result, disk traffic will become dominated by writes. And before Flash came along, we had only DRAM-based caches. And this wasn't quite true. But now with larger caches, it's, it's becoming increasingly true. So we hear about 
for example, in the virtual desktop infrastructure workloads, most of the data is writes, 80% are writes. Uh, even if you look at uh, guidelines from Microsoft for its applications like Exchange, you know, they used to be one-third writes and two-third reads, and it has flipped now, so it's more writes than reads. So by definition, a write-optimized layout does a good job with writes by coalescing uh, block writes regardless of their addresses. And in doing so, they leverage the sequential throughput of disk, which is pretty good. You know, if you think about it, even a slow disk will give you at least 40 megabytes per second of sequential throughput. So with IOs are four kilobytes each. That means 10,000 IOPS. So you can, with right coalescing, get 10,000 IOPS from each disk. Now, in, in practice, you, you know, the system generally doesn't get there because there are other bottlenecks, but it gives you an idea of the, the conceptual possibility. Finally, with right coalescing, you're never updating blocks in place. So snapshots are easy to get. Okay. You don't have to do anything special. You just build a tree of, of indirect blocks on top of what you have, and you get a snapshot. And so in, con in contrast, with a write-in-place system, such as what you'll have with a read-optimized layout, the system would need to, you know, whenever it's about to update a block for the first time after a snapshot, it'll need to copy out the pre-image of that block. So there's an additional copy overhead. And if you are taking snapshots frequently, then pretty much every write will result in such a copy. Okay, so there's an extra read and a write. Okay, so there are two flavors of write optimized disk layouts. The first is what I call hole filling file systems, such as Waffle, NetApp's Waffle, and ZFS developed at some. What they do is write anywhere they find free space. And this works well initially when the entire disk space is, is free, but over time, the free space gets fragmented into smaller and smaller holes. So the system is forced then to write into these holes in a more and more random manner. One way to look at this is that these systems do opportunistic coalescing. So when they find a, a large hole, they can coalesce a whole bunch of blocks. But if you don't, you know, you're forced to do some random writes. The other flavor is, is writing in large stripes, which is, uh, which you would you know, recognize as, as log-structured file system technology, where there is a garbage collection process that sweeps uh, holes into full stripes, such that the system is always writing in large full stripes. And this has a bunch of advantages. One is that you can that writes can always be coalesced, it's guaranteed. Another advantage is that you don't, you don't have to worry about block boundaries because you're, co you're concatenating a whole bunch of blocks anyway. And so this supports variable block size quite naturally, which in turn supports compression because after compression you're left with blocks of varying sizes. So this, is, this makes for a you know, very natural fit for compression. There is also a subtle point here that it, you know, it's not as good as preserving sequential locality for reads, but it preserves the right order of locality. And by right order, I mean, the, by right order locality, I mean that if a bunch of blocks are written together, they are likely to be read together. So think about a file uh, or, or let's say a document in a file system. Generally, applications will write out the whole document at once. And the file system might do some indirection and spread the blocks out. But since they are written all together, when you read that same file, 
you'd benefit from the fact that they were written together and you can read them also sequentially. And as we are getting more and more layers of interaction between the application and storage, so you know, there could be a local file system and then there could be a file system within the hypervisor like VMFS. So with more such interactions, the right order locality is becoming more and more important compared to sequential locality. So lock structuring is, is prevalent in SSDs. In fact, every SSD has a lock structure file system within it. But it hasn't so far caught, caught on with this. And the reason is garbage collection. As uh, the uh, Gecko author said yesterday, garbage collection is the Achilles heel of, of lock structuring because it can put a load on the system to bring down its foreground performance. And there are a bunch of reasons for it, but one big reason is that garbage collection requires a fast index. But guess what? With, with Flash, you can have such an index. There, there are actually, there's actually more to it than that, but I won't go into the details. Okay, so assuming that uh, we follow the choices that, you know, the right choice, you, you are left with a system that is efficient, you know, in that the various components, they work well together, they make up for each other's deficiencies. So you get the read IOPS directly from using a large cache. You get your write IOPS from write coalescing because of writing in large stripes, which, which in turn relies on garbage collection, which requires an optimized block map, which is partly enabled by Flash. So Flash is not directly giving you the write IOPS, but it's a catalyst. I just noticed that I'm running out of time. I ha okay. Um, Roger, do you think I should go through this? This is my last slide. Okay. So this is what I would like to see. These days, SSDs are optimized for legacy systems. So either consumer devices or legacy storage systems. And that requires handling random writes well. So you have a complex page mapping <coughs> algorithm and a complex controller and, and firmware. And it can come in the way of getting the most out of the drive. So with new storage software, you can do garbage collection at the system level. The, the drive, you know, it can still do uh, stuff at an erase unit level or erase block level, such as wear leveling or read disturb or, or bad, bad block management. But there's no need to, to remap the pages. And, and if you did that, you know, the drive will have a much smaller map and will, will work fast. It will essentially remove a layer of indirection from the drive, or at least make that layer thinner. And, and that's good. There was, this, uh, there was a talk in this year's FAST about removing layers of indirection. And you, know, you need that indirection somewhere. If you're doing garbage collection at the system level, uh, you will need that in the storage software. But you already have layers of indirection in the storage software. You know, all storage is virtualized now, so there's this map between logical to physical anyway. So you can support things like thin provisioning and snapshots. And you can subsume the, the page map into that layer. The second thing I have here is very speculative. 
uh, and I'm not even sure what it means. But if we, you know, knowing that uh, that Flash works really well for read caching, perhaps we could have an API that is optimized for it. You know, maybe uh, a, a block device that keeps running even if it is losing blocks. The third is is that I would like to see more research on caching and QoS. So it's, it's very important to have algorithms that can predict the miss rate curve, as it is called. So at what, you know, at various cache size, what the miss rate would be like. If you can predict that, then we can size the cache. Also, if you have multiple workloads, you know, how much of the size, uh, how much of the cache to give to each workload. And here there are two, two goals that could be conflicting. One is to meet uh, the SLAs for each workload, and the other is to, to use the resources efficiently. So, you know, there is work going on, and there was a talk uh, yesterday about uh, QoS for tiered storage. I would like to see even more. So that's, that's all I have. I'll put this uh, design space back up here so we can, uh, if you have questions, we can use this as a context. Hi, Fred Douglas, EMC. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. As somebody did some of the early work on, on log structure file systems, even predating the uh, Mendel's full implementation of the first such system, uh, it's really interesting to see how far they've come in all these years. But I think that the claim, the, the quote that you put up there, which was the original statement that said, uh, memories are getting larger, therefore caching will be so effective, therefore we don't need to read from disks, has always been chasing a moving target because memories are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you know, we couldn't have imagined 20, 30 years ago how large a memory would be now, but nor could we imagine how large the storage system would be that it would be in front of. And so with all the shift toward big data and the amount of data that people are processing, do you believe that memories really do make that, that trade-off such that you don't have to worry about reads? It depends on the application. Uh, and, and two, you know, for the big data kind of application, you would be reading from disk. Uh, in that particular case, actually, you'll be generally reading in large chunk. So, um, well, a, a, at least even if the layout does not preserve sequential locality, based on the sequential pattern, you can do some prefetching from disk. But you're right, there are applications for, for which you'll be reading sequentially from disk. Elia Shalev from IBM. Uh, you, you said that you do not uh, basically trust Flash to keep uh, the right buffer, right? Uh, and um, you, <laughs> you said that you do not uh, trust the Flash enough to keep the right uh, the dirty, dirty right data. And yet you're saying that uh, uh, you can use it for metadata for the right optimized layout. Yeah. How? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, uh, you know, I, I said earlier that uh, yeah, flash uh, as a write buffer has some limitations around reliability. Um, and yet we could use it as a block map. Uh, what you can do is still use it as a cache for the block map. The block map can still be on disk. So it continues to hold. You know, that uh, your block map is stored reliably. And even in the cache, if you find a block map block that is corrupted, you can toss it away. Jeff Kenning, Harvey Mudd College. Um, I've believed for a long time that we're going about this wrong because everybody is building solid state disks that want to pretend that they inside are spinning and that they have moving heads and that they behave like real hard disk drives and yet 
you know, you are seeing things in your own work that, uh, that are being damaged or, or being harmed by, by this pretense. And in your last slide, you sort of imply that you would like better access to the actual underlying device. Why do you think flash manufacturers haven't been answering this need, which I think that you know, every large storage manufacturer has? That's a good question. So the answer, I guess, is that the flash manufacturers, the SSD manufacturers, are optimizing their devices for commodity storage. So or other consumer devices, right? Uh, and consumer devices are running relatively simple software. So most of the smarts have got to be in the device, which for enterprise storage systems can come in the way. Uh, just to give you some stats, I forget now actually, there are a few hexabytes of flash being sold for consumer devices and only a few petabytes for enterprise. So there's a factor of 1,000 there. Thank you. Peter Desnoyers, Northeastern. Um, an observation and a question. So first, the, uh, the paper at FAST, uh, the Grupp paper, an, a subtext of that was essentially- Sorry, which paper? The Bleak Future That's paper right. from uh -huh. Steve Swanson's group. Right. Uh, the subtext there was sort of that most flash is going into iPods and USB drives, and so that's what vendors build for. Um, now, we do, in the last year or so, seem to have a lot of people like you putting, you know, basically if we put our money up, then maybe there'll be a market. And so it seems that they're projecting 15% SSD sales uh, this year instead of 3 or 5% was last year. But um, my question was more, it's my blue sky question about Flash. Do you see... Here we have a description of something which is very much optimizing an existing system. You know, it's better, faster, cheaper, some combination of those. Do you see anything new that we'll be able to do with our systems with, these, with solid state technologies, or does that really have to wait for the next generation of less storage-like devices? Right. So to be honest, uh, I do not know where it will go. Um, I do think it's plausible that as more flash enters the enterprise storage space, uh, the manufacturers will optimize it more and more for, for enterprise use. So uh, perhaps they'll find a way out of the issues around reliability and performance as, as density is increased. Uh, it's also possible that you know new storage, uh, new solid state technologies uh, will will replace flash. But just to give you some perspective, it has taken flash 20 years to get into enterprise storage, and you know the the other storage class memories that we hear about. You know you hear about a new one almost every year or so. Uh, they will have a long lead time. So, so far we have flash. It's not clear that it is the one to replace disk, but that's what we have. 